All right, and for this third one, we have that the height of a baseball after it is hit by a bat is modeled by the function blah, where h of t is the height in meters above the ground and t is the time in seconds. So h of t is height, okay, and t is time. And here we have our units. I'm going to put them in red. We have meters, we have seconds. All right, so for part A, we need to write down the height of the ball above the ground at the instant it is hit by the bat. So take a second and think about it. So first things first, we have our function. See, our function is h of t equals negative 4.8 t squared plus 21t plus 1.2. So a couple of things, a couple of common misconceptions. First of all, h of t, which is practic practically the same as f of x, is the same as y. Okay, so if for you it's easier to think of this as y equals, then by all means do so. This is y, this is technically x, and this is also technically x. All right, so that's the first thing. If you'd rather think about it that way, go ahead. All right, I'm just going to do it the original way because, you know, whatever, I'll be consistent. But just to clear up some doubts that people may have, that's the first thing I'm going to say. The second thing I'm going to say is that context matters for these kind of questions. So if we need to write down the height of the ball above the ground at the instant it is hit by the bat, you need to think, when is it hit by the bat? When is it hit by the bat? Well, t is time, right? And t is time in seconds after the ball was hit, after the ball was hit. So in zero seconds, the ball is getting hit. In zero seconds, the ball is getting hit. In zero seconds, the ball is getting hit. So we plug in zero for t. We have 4.8 um, parentheses zero squared plus 21 parent, uh, parentheses zero plus 1.2. We do all of this in our calculator, you end up with t equals 1.2. Why does this happen? Well, negative 4.8 times 0 goes away to 0. Anything times 0 is 0. 21 times 0 goes away to 0. We end up with just this guy. See, so t is 1.2. Now, what set of points is it? Well, since I plugged in 0 here, that means I have 0 comma something. What is my something in this case? What I got over here. 0 comma 1.2. So if I go ahead and graph this, there's a couple things I know about it. First of all, I'm going to have the y-axis over here at 0 comma 1.2. And I also know that it is a parabola because of the squared. So it's going to be something like this or like this. Which of the two is it? It is the one on the left because there is a negative sign. If there's a negative sign, it looks like this. If there's a positive sign, it looks like this. What's a way to remember it? If it's positive, it's happy. This looks a little bit like a smiley face. Might look a little bit creepy, but there it is. Anyways, so my graph looks probably something like this. All right? Whatever. That is part A. Part B. Find the value of t when the ball hits the ground. So, when it hits the ground, am I talking about my y or my x? In this context, I would be talking about my y. Why would it be my y? <laughs> why would it be my y? Because y is height. Okay, so when the ball hits the ground, uh, ground is going to be a sort of height, and the ground will be height of 0. So how do I express height of 0? I express height of 0 by saying y equals 0. How do I say y equals 0 in this context? By making this equal to 0. So I make h of t equal to 0. Notice that there's a difference between h of t being equal to 0 and h of 0 being equal to something. Okay. In the first case, you are making your y equal 0. In the second case, you're making your x equal 0. All right. So really let that sink in. Okay. That is very important. Anyways, in this scenario, we're doing the case on top. So my y is going to be 0. See? So I'm going to take my trusty, rusty, you know, formula thing ranging over here. Uh, I'm just going to make some space. Give me a second. Okie dokie. So again, we are making y equal to 0. Why are we making y equal to 0? Because we're 
analyzing when the ball hits the ground. See? By y is height, that's why I work it that way. So all of this has to be equal to zero. See? So zero equals negative 4.8 t squared plus 21t plus 1.2. And when you're in this scenario with a parabola, okay, you have a couple options to find it. See? Um, you have three main options, all right? And I hope some of these ring a bell. So you have factoring. You have just straight up uh, the quadratic formula, see, which looks like this, negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. Okay, this thing that you've probably seen before, this gives you the zeros, okay? And the last option is just calculator stuffs, see? I'm going to choose calculator stuffs because even though it might be a little bit slower sometimes, it always works, see? And I'm all for following a process that you can always do. And so that is what we're about to do. So how does it work? Well, first things first, we're going to plug in our equation up here. See? So I'm going to put negative 4.8x, in this case t, but in my calculator can only put x, um, squared plus 21x plus 1.2. I go ahead and graph. All right, so... I got a little bit lucky. I can see part of my graph. Now I'm going to play around with my window. See? Now, before playing around with my window, I got to understand I need to be able to see the zeros on my graph. What do I mean by zeros? I need to be able to see this guy and this guy. See? I need to see the zeros of my x-axis. So where um, my parabola cuts through the x-axis. Why is it called zero? Because both of these points, okay, both of these points are x comma something. Oh, <laughs> fuck. I said that very incorrectly. <laughs> Both of these points are x comma 0. Okay, and so that's why they're called your zeros. See? So it's something comma 0. All right? It's something comma 0. And so using my calculator, ba -ba -da -bum, I'm going to go ahead and try using zoom standard, which is zoom 0. Okay? Sorry, zoom fit. So zoom and 0. Press enter. I see if I get my zeros, and I can see that I get one of them. See? I do not get the other one, though. Now, let's take a moment. Here, I am seeing one of my zeros, right? I'm not seeing the other one. The other one is on the left side, which is actually conveniently how I drew it here. Do I care about the one on the left? Do I care about the one on the left? Well, x is, what was x again? x was time, see? Time in seconds. What was y? What was height? Height in meters. So anything to the left of here, see, so I'm going to put it in this sort of yellow. Anything to the left is going to be a negative value. Now, ladies and gentlemen, does a negative value make sense for time? Can you have negative seconds, negative minutes? Well, it depends how high you are, but hopefully you're not high in math class, okay? Uh, this negative value, this zero, is not a valid solution because of the context, okay? It exists in my parabola, but given the context of a bat, I mean of a ball getting hit by a bat and when it lands and etc. and blah, 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 and time being in between, negative time makes no sense. So it is okay that my calculator shows the zero on the right side because I do not give a fuck about the zero on the right side. Why do I not? Because of the context. I only care about time values that actually make sense. So, whoops, I forgot to show a little bit. So, procedure. You put your formula in y equals, see? Then you will be calculating. See, you're calculating your zeros. Where is calculate? Second trace, see? So that blue button up there, you might want to hit calc. Okay, so of course, now I'm looking at my zeros. Now you know why it's called a zero. Why was it called a zero? Because your x-intercepts are x comma zero. See, it's something comma zero. That is why they're called zeros. Yeah, but so we pick zero. It is asking for left bound and right bound. What is that truly asking for? So this is what your calculator does. You have your function, it looks like this. You have two zeros that I'm going to put in red or orange. You have this one and this one. 
So when you have left bound and right bound, you're restricting the area that like your calculator scans, and that way you make sure you get the zero that you want. If I want the zero on the right side, it would be wise to put a left bound here, a right bound here, and that means my calculator will, will scan like this. It'll find all the zeros in there, which of course is only one. So left bound, right bound does matter. I imagine you can already tell that if your thing is like this, and your left bound, right bound is something like that, you're gonna have trouble because there's two of them, see? So left bound, right bound does matter and that is why, see? All right, so I'm gonna put left bound over here, right bound over there, should be good enough. Now they give us guess, okay? Okay, your calculator knows where the zero is. Guess is really like, pick the zero, see? You're like mega double checking, all right? Which is actually convenient in a case like this one. But anyways, I'd much rather care about under you understanding why you're picking a left bound, why you're picking a right bound. As long as you understand the why in things in life, you can like really dig deeper and, and get to know stuff better, see? Don't get used to memorizing stuff, understand why. This is what your calculator is doing, left bound, right bound. Which flipping zero are you asking for? There it is. My zero is 4.431415. So I'm gonna write that over here. So for part B, we have that it is 4.431415. Do not forget your units, seconds. And if you would like to do uh, three significant figures, it would be 4.43. Why is that three significant figures? Because you go one, two, three. On the third one, you compare it to the one on the right. Do you round it up or does it stay the same? It stays the same because this is a one. And yeah, that's about it. Three significant figures is the one on the bottom. Up top is the long version. I recommend the long version always because then you you know, don't miss up the significant figures because it can happen. All right, whatever. Now the last part, which we actually talked about a little bit earlier, we have part C. So, for part C, we need to state an appropriate domain for T in this model. Now, I'm sure some of you are already thinking, what the fuck? What the heck is domain? Yeah. Intuitively, I'm not gonna, there's more space up here, so I'll do it up here. Intuitively, when we talk about domain, it's going to be your X values. When we talk about range, okay, that will be your Y values. And so part C is asking for state an appropriate domain for T in this model. So it says 4t, which is like a hint, like, hey, it's about your x values, see? So 4t. Um, I actually touched, touched upon this earlier, right? So if I have time for my x, here to for my domain, all right? For my x-axis and my y-axis is height, it makes sense that my domain has to be positive. See, I cannot have negative time. I can only have positive time. So Initially, I would say, well, time has to be from zero to infinity. See, that would be my first initial thought. However, and this is where the IB gets a little tricky. Okay. However, if you go from zero to infinity, how does my model look like? Well, my model would go from, and when we talk about model, we're talking about like basically just your, your function. Okay your function given the domain you're, you know, choosing. <laughs> so my function would look something like this. It would go until there. And so choosing a domain from zero to infinity leaves all this extra space, all this extra data that I don't really care about, see? You don't really care about, you know, the, the ball going into deep underground in the center of the earth. So that's just not realistic. It's not what you care about. See, so all of this data here, you don't really give a crap about, okay? And so that's when you start thinking, okay, maybe my domain should be a little bit smaller. Okay, how smaller? Well, when does it touch the ground? When did it touch the ground from part B? It touched it at 4.43 seconds. Ah, so a wise domain is what I have in orange here, which from B from zero to 4.43, okay? How do you write that in fancy math language? You can say that your t has to be greater than zero, see, which is doing this. Um, and also t has to be less than 4.43, which is you doing this, 
Okay. What do you end up with? You end up with what's in the middle. See? All right. Cool. What's another fancy math language that you can use? You can go like this. All right. That expresses the same thing as up top. They are synonyms. And believe it or not, you can also just say t has to be greater than or equal to four. Blah, blah, blah. Or sorry, or equal to zero and less than or equal to 4.43. And so these three ways that I just wrote it out are all super valid. They will all score the maximum amount of points. And that would be part C. Before we move on to the next problem, all right, a quick sort of hint that applies for everything. See, notice for part C, we needed to state an appropriate domain for T in this model. And what we defined was that our probability domain for t in this model is when the ball hits the ground. See, after the ball hits the ground, we don't care about that data. See, we don't care about the data that goes after this, right? We don't give a crap about that. We only care about our data when the ball is, it gets hit and then when the ball hits the ground. Now, how did I figure out that this was 4.43? Well, it was for, from part B. See, so the sort of hint or the sort of idea that I want you to start getting in your head. All right, is that what you do from part A can help you with part B and what you do from part B can help you with part C. All right, that can be a helpful thing for uh, if you're stuck in part C or you're stuck in part B, think about it. Yo, what did I do last? Does that help me with what's coming? Sometimes it doesn't. I mean, what we did in part A wasn't really necessary for part B, but what we did in part C was essential for part B. So take a moment, think about it. All right, that kind of stuff matters. It adds on and at the day of the test, it's a tool you might need. That is for the third one.